everybody and uh, and thank you for joining what I imagine will be for you and for us the highlight of today's conference. Uh, I'm Markus Brunemeyer, the director of the Bentheim Center for Finance at Princeton University and uh, we together with the Atlanta Fed are organizing this conference today. We're very honored to have uh, the Atlanta Fed president and CEO Raphael Bostic with us to deliver the important keynote titled Using Finance to Unburden Minorities and Create Racial Equality and Equity. For many of us, Raphael needs no introduction, but let me just say a few, a few words about him. So Raphael became the Atlanta Fed president uh, in two, uh, 2017, where he oversees all the bank's activity, including monetary policy, bank supervision and regulation and payment services. Before that, he was a chair professor at the University of Southern California, where his research spanned many fields, including home ownership, housing finance, neighborhood change, and the role of institutions in shaping policy effectiveness. And you can see this, these are all important issues for today's conference. And from 2009 to 2012, he also served as assistant secretary for policy development and research at the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Of course, I could many, mention many more accomplishments, but I don't want to uh, keep you away. And you, I know that you're all eager to hear Raphael. So with no further ado, I will give the floor to Raphael. And please, uh, we will have a Q&A. Please submit your questions in the Q&A function or the chat uh, function. And uh, then you know, we collect your questions and we'll ask Raphael and he's happy to answer questions as many as time permits. So Raphael, the floor is yours and we're very glad to have you and looking forward to your insights. Thanks. Well, thank you, Marcus. It's uh, really, really good to be here. Uh, I wanna thank you for the, the kind introduction and for inviting me to speak at this important conference. Uh, you keep calling me the highlight of the day. Uh, it's setting high, high expectations. Uh, I like to talk them down a little bit, but I'll, I'll do my best and we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Um, I, I would also um, like to just say I'm really excited that we are partnering uh, with Princeton and the Bentheim Center for Finance. Um, you guys have done a lot of heavy lifting for this, and uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I also want to say our staff has done a, a great job. Uh, I'm really proud of all that we've accomplished today. So this is really a triumph for both of us, so thank you for, for all your work. Um, I have to say, though, that though I'm happy to be here, uh, the impetus for this conference emerged from events that were not nearly as happy. Uh, Professor Brunemeyer called me, uh, sent me an email actually, uh, soon after George Floyd's death. Uh, and at that time, there was a period of pretty intense social unrest. Things were, were pretty tough. Now, I had just written my essay on the moral and economic imperative of ending racism. And he had read it and he said he liked the message. Uh, he told me he felt that, and I'm quoting you here, Marcus, uh, thoughtful actions are needed to remove racial injustice in our society. Uh, and Marcus told me he wanted the Bentheim Center to more actively contribute to a better society. Uh, and I have to say, I was very pleased that he was persuaded from my essay uh, that the Atlanta Fed represented a good opportunity for partnership in advancing that goal. Um, I enthusiastically accepted his invitation for us to work together and grudgingly agreed to give a keynote address for this conference. So uh, as an aside, uh, you know, Marcus mentioned in the first introduction uh, to start off the conference that I was on vacation when uh, we had our first set of conversations. Uh, that's true. Uh, and as I was thinking about um, the, the ability of my essay to persuade him to reach out to me, I, it made me think back on uh, one of our first conversations where I actually tried to persuade him uh, on the benefits of uh, doing RV vacationing, because I was in an RV at the time. Uh, now, I actually don't think he's moved very much on that. So uh, maybe I'll stick to writing as opposed to, to verbal type of persuasion. But uh, I'm gonna get you on that at some point, Marcus. We're, we'll get you out there, that'll be good. Uh, now, before I get too deep into, into things, uh, please do keep in mind that these thoughts that I'm gonna uh, express right now are mine and don't necessarily reflect the views of my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee or at the Atlanta Fed. 
Now, in preparing my remarks for today, uh, a particular passage in my essay hung in my consciousness. I wrote that a commitment to an inclusive society also means a commitment to an inclusive economy, and then followed with this. Such an economy would represent a rebuke of systemic racism and other exclusionary structures. It would represent a true embrace of the principles that all are created equal and should enjoy unburdened life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In that passage, one word stands out to me today, unburdened. Unfortunately, today we will be hearing a lot, and I've already heard some, about burden, specifically about the ways that policies and practices in finance and economic markets create outcomes that put burdens on minorities. These are important to document and understand. And I'm hopeful that with understanding will come efforts to develop an alternative set of policies and practices that eliminate such race-based disparities. In my remarks today, I'd like to push this thinking a bit further in a way that has implications for what we research and how we do this research. I would offer that it is critical to not only recognize the role of individual practices and policies in creating racial inequity, but also confront the ways in which institutions and systems perpetuate and entrench racial inequalities in the economy and in our broader society. In our country, we too often assume institutions are benign. But people shape institutions which can intentionally or otherwise contribute to outcomes uh, that are far from harmless. Now, Professor Jenkins' presentation on the municipal bond market in the preceding session makes this point clearly. This bond market is hardly on the frontier of innovation, and few would characterize it as one where active predatory activity resides. However, it is an institution that has exercised enormous influence in shaping access to opportunity. As, pressure, as Professor Jenkins illustrates, perceptions of race and conventions of how to consider race have long been embedded in its rules and guidelines with implications for the allocation of access to housing, employment, schools, and other services. While it seems incongruous that a $4 trillion market could do anything subtly, Professor Jenkins' work introduces this possibility and the negative consequences for black families and communities. Now, I'd like to con continue this line of exploration, focusing on one of the most important vehicles for building wealth and economic security, housing. Official policy that racialized access to mortgage financing and thus decent affordable housing in the post-World War II years is perhaps the most important, though hardly the sole source of a racial wealth disparity that has not appreciably narrowed over the past half century. Richard Rothstein and others have exhaustively detailed explicit federal, state, and local public policies that effectively segregated cities and suburbs. And in a gra groundbreaking book published in the mid-1990s, sociologists Melvin Oliver and Thomas Shapiro detailed the systematic methods by which African Americans were, in the author's words, locked out of the greatest mass-based opportunity for wealth accumulation in American history. This deliberate exclusion occurred largely through official redlining instituted by federal agencies established as part of the New Deal, the Homeowners Loan Corporation and the Federal Housing Administration, or FHA. Now, redlining was the explicit practice of drawing maps identifying largely black neighborhoods as unfit places to make federally backed home mortgage loans. A 1938 FHA underwriting manual clearly states the overarching philosophy of redlining. If a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that properties shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. A change in social or racial occupancy generally contributes to instability and a decline in values. And you heard this also from Professor Jenkins talking just a few moments ago. Now, this was official policy, not the machinations of a few rogue actors. Public policy of the day reflected conventional thinking in the residential real estate community. As Kianga Yamada Taylor 
an assistant professor of African American studies here at Princeton pointed out in her 2019 book, which is titled Race for Profit, How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermined Black Home Ownership, the National Association of Real Estate Boards in the 1920s threatened punishment and revocation of membership to any broker who disrupted racial patterns on a given block or in a particular neighborhood. And similar language appeared, appeared in the organization's code of ethics until the 1950s. Appraisers from the very start, Taylor wrote, established as a given that racial diversity hurt property value. Redlining was not officially outlawed until the 1968 Fair Housing Act. By then, the damage was done. A Chicago Fed working paper revised in 2019 noted that redlining curtailed access to credit, it allowed uh, higher borrowing costs, and it led to disinvestment in poor urban American neighborhoods with long-run repercussions. Harmful as it was, redlining was not the sole culprit in denying Black Americans fair access to home ownership. Mortgage lenders, realtors, and investors used various methods that drained credit and wealth from urban neighborhoods. Take contract for deed purchases. Contract for deed purchases can be attractive to someone who doesn't have a high or any credit score and may not be able to afford the larger down payment that usually comes with a traditional mortgage. But in a contract for deed purchase, the buyer accrues no interest in the property until the final payment has been made. Essentially, these home purchasers accumulate no equity as they pay off their notes and face repossession for missing a single payment, even years into the life of a contract. Contract sales force buyers to pay more and get less for their money. A new paper by Duke University's Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity paints a grim picture of how contract for deed sales exploited thousands of black Chicagoans seeking to purchase homes in the 1950s and 60s. This practice was, in their words, a, systemic, a systematic, legally sanctioned plunder of black wealth. The Duke researchers combed through 50,000 land titles, deeds, and court records. The resulting work convincingly demonstrates how public policy and accepted practices in the residential real estate and mortgage finance industries encourage the plunder of the mostly black inner city and the development of nearly all white suburbs. The research found that more than three fourths of homes purchased by African American Chicagoans in the 50s and 60s were sold on contract. According to the researchers, contract selling was backed by the same banks that denied loans to black home buyers as well as by investment syndicates of white business leaders and city government officials. All those players profited by exploiting what the authors call a separate and unequal housing market to the disadvantage of black families. African Americans purchasing on contract paid an average of $587 more a month, and that's in 2019 dollars, than they would have had they paid the fair price for their home through a conventional FHA-backed mortgage the Duke researchers calculated. And all told, this research estimates that over those two decades, during the post home homeownership boom that fueled sufficient wealth to lay the foundation for the nation's vaunted middle class, contract for de deed sales expropriated $3.2 to $4 billion from Chicago's black community. And that's a conservative estimate, the authors noted, because of large gaps in the surviving data. Now, lest you think that this is a relic of a bygone era, the Atlanta Fed's own Ann Carpenter, who is an assistant vice president on our community and economic development team, recently co-authored a study looking at contract for deed sales in the Midwest, this time between 2004 and 2017. That research finds similar patterns to the Du Bois Cook Center work and makes a compelling case that we need stronger regulations and enforcement at the local and state level to prevent the further destabilization of communities that were hit hardest by the foreclosure crisis, which was prompted by the financial crisis and Great Recession. Now, one aspect that emerges repeatedly in much of this work is that racism and racial injustice was individually profitable. Investors in bond markets received higher returns for financing infrastructure in black neighborhoods. 
white investors in Chicago's contract for deed scheme received higher returns than they could have through other investments. Importantly, in these cases, investors may not have had any taste for discrimination. They just accepted the prevailing rules as established and participated. The bias was embedded in the institution. Without an active scrutiny of the rules and a concern for equity, the cost of these biases were able to continue unchecked. Now, though I focus the bulk of my remarks in this regard on housing and home ownership, it's important to emphasize that systemic structures that made it extremely difficult for black Americans to accrue savings and wealth have extended far beyond housing. Professor Jenkins' work offers one example of this, but there are others. Writers such as Rothstein and others have pointed out that many New Deal programs, which have long been credited with rescuing the nation from the Great Depression and laying the groundwork for future prosperity, withheld important benefits from most Black Americans. For example, the Social Security Act of 1935 excluded farm workers and domestic workers from the public pension program and unemployment insurance. Those occupations were disproportionately held by Blacks. As a result of the design of these programs, according to the writer Tennessee Coates, when President Franklin Roosevelt signed Social Security into law, 65% of African Americans nationally and between 70 and 80% in the South were ineligible. Thus, for many years, Blacks were effectively prevented from tapping into the primary program designed to preserve savings and wealth in one's later years. Now this clearly adversely affected the economic resilience of black families. Moreover, and particularly important, given the importance that many scholars have attached to intergenerational transfers of wealth for entrepreneurial, for entrepreneurship, and for economic mobility, this has also contributed to lower rates of small business creation and a weaker financial standing for black businesses. I will also add that although my remarks have focused today on the burdens of black Americans, burdens are not limited just to them. There are institutions, policies, and practices that place challenges on people of multiple racial backgrounds, and these constrain and limit their economic resilience and mobility as well. So let me close by saying a bit about today and a path forward. Today's program is pretty much what I expected when we put out the call for paper. The fields of finance and economics have been documenting racial disparities for decades, and the excellent papers today continue in that tradition. They are good contributions that are helping to illuminate maladies that include intergenerational poverty, restricted access to capital, residential segregation, and the persistent racial wealth gap. Yet progress has been in, in, in incremental. The median white household in America today holds 10 times the asset of the typical black household, something that uh, Professor Henry noted early in the first session today. Unfortunately, uh, this ratio is not much improved from what it was more than 100 years ago. This argues that something more fundamental has happened. The fields of economics and finance must acknowledge that the influence of race is multidimensional and persists over time. We must look under the, under the hood at our institutions to see and truly understand their design and its implications. With such an understanding, we can then find more creative and accurate ways to incorporate race into our models, estimation approaches, and narratives. This, I hope, will yield better insights and result in a set of policy prescriptions that can truly create meaningful and lasting change. Now, I could stop there, uh, but being that I was a professor for many years, and I'm talking in an academic setting, I can't resist the impulse of closing by offering something that may sound a bit like homework. Now, I've already put forth one assignment. In your research, think about how you ask questions, particularly how you incorporate historical and institutional realities into your research design. Examine the role played by institutions and structures and explore how the burdens they impart have contributed to the inequities that are still with us. But there are other things you might have on your to-do list that I will mention too. First, deeply consider how you teach finance. 
If we are to construct a more equitable economy and financial system, the people who construct it need to know and appreciate the history of our system, some of which we've discussed today. Too many people, both generally and in finance, and economics for that matter, are unaware of the role the financial institutions and structures have played in calcifying inequity. And second, examine how you engage with practitioners and the professional space more broadly. How should we think about internships, for example? What steps are being taken to help ensure that opportunities are more equitably distributed among students? We all have a vital role to play if we are to confront historical and institutional inequities in the financial system that are supposed to serve our economy and all of our citizens. The most egregious of the programs that spawned and even codified segregation and exclusion into our institutions, they're long gone, yet their effects are pernicious and persistent. In addition, work by very scholars, some of them you're hearing from today, makes a compelling case that there are institutions and programs still operating that have similarly troubling effects. All that notwithstanding, I'm here before you optimistic for the future. Why? Actually, because we're having this conversation. And I have to say, I wouldn't have imagined this was possible even a few months ago. And that we're talking about this tells me there is an appetite for change and a willingness to work to affect that change. Progress and ultimately success in this work will help ensure that we move ever closer to achieving a more perfect union, one that in fact, and not just in words, allows for unburdened life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all of its citizens. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll open it up for questions, I guess. Thanks a lot, uh, Rafael. So I will interject the questions from the chat. So if you have uh, questions, please uh, type them in in the Q&A. So the first question I would like to ask is from uh, Glenn Sch Schlachtus. Uh, he would like to know, um, you know, what are the explicit measurements to the strategies that most likely be effective in addressing and ending the lending redlinings in, at the macro level? Is there any particular proposals you can throw at us uh, saying, okay, this will really make a difference or we should push this particular agenda? So this is one of those where I think data matters a lot and creating an awareness of what's happening is, is incredibly important. You know, we have a, a regulation here in the U.S. called the Community Reinvestment Act and another one called the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. And what those did was really make a lot of data public and allowed us to do analysis and document that these things were actually happening. I, I remember when I when I was getting my PhD, there was a lot of discussion about discrimination in mortgage lending, and many bankers thought there was no way this was possible. Uh, it, it couldn't happen. And so the Boston Fed challenged them to give us the data and let us see if you're not so worried. And then they gave us the data and discovered there was discrimination out there. So mm -hmm. that getting data and creating that shared understanding and appreciation of what these patterns actually are and how they're playing out is important because that, that awareness is, is critical. Uh, a second thing I would say, though, is that uh, we in the research community need to be much more forthcoming about what we know about value in neighborhoods and what preserves values and what actually degrades it. You know, I do a lot of work on affordable housing, and um, it, when you go into communities, there's a, a general belief that, you know, if, if there's a, a development that gets put up in a neighborhood, um, that property values are going to be adversely impacted. There's a host of research out there which shows that that's actually not the case. And so we can use our talents and skills to really push back against long-held conventional wisdoms that some of them come from the Jim Crow era. You know, like a lot of the, the, the documents were just conventional beliefs that didn't have evidence based on them that we can call, call out and, um, and really try to create a, a different kind of understanding. I actually think in today's environment, this is more important, where there's a lot of noise and, and, and conversation, some of which is evidence-based and some of which it is not, that we get out there and aggressively push back against things that we know are not true. Because we, we definitely need to make sure that facts carry the day, uh, because that's how we're gonna get to sort of a truly equitable system in terms of its functioning. 
So connecting up to this, can I just uh, ask another question? You know, if we move away from personal banking where loan officer is deciding, we move much more to FinTech and automated statistical uh, assignments of mortgages. Do you think that will help or do you think there will be some statistical discrimination popping up? Uh, and how do you see this problematic, you know, with machine learning and other elements introducing statistical learning? Do you think the problem will be gone with new technology with FinTech companies and there's a huge opportunity to really reduce uh, racial discrimination? Or do you think there will be other problems? And do you see any ways the academic community should discuss that and then avoid at least that we don't have any statistical discrimination? Sure, so that's a very good question, Marcus. This is one um, I wrestle with because I think it, it can cut both ways. On one level, taking um, discretion out, that human discretion out so that the gray area is extremely narrow, uh, does a great job at, um, at eliminating some of this bias. You know, I've, I've, I guess one chapter from my dissertation was on this, and it showed that in places where uh, an applicant was clearly in the green, there were not very many differences that we saw, but it was when you got to the gray and individual loan officers got to make judgments, then all of a sudden you saw the split. All right, so if we can eliminate or reduce the space where that judgment comes in, we can effectively make progress in this, and that's important. The part that makes me nervous uh, to be honest, is the learning part of machine learning. And how do we make sure we know what machines and these algorithms are learning as they're collecting more information and modifying the algorithm? Because they may learn that Martinez as a name is associated with uh, lower credit score or poor performance or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden Martinez becomes the decision role. And so how we program these things and how we put guardrails on what these programs can learn and how they learn, that's the part that I think we have to think hard about to make sure that as evolution happens, as these, these rules and, and, uh, um, and parameters get more sophisticated and complex, they don't embed things that we as a society don't value uh, or things that, that we think adversely affect society. I'm not a, a computer guy, right? So I don't know how you do this, but I think it's something that we actually need to talk about explicitly uh, to make sure that, um, that, that, um, that the systems that are in play continue to promote uh, equity uh, and conformity with how we, we want our markets to function. Thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, connecting you further up on that. So you mentioned in your talk that, you know, how to teach finance or education. So Asfin uh, Shaheen, she, she essentially thought, oh, um, is it important that we have changed educational systems? How important is it that, you know, we, you mentioned for institutional uh, arrangements in the past carrying on today. Do you think education is much more important than anything else in order to, you know, train our society, our young kids, that they are much more rationally aware? And how do you see that, you know, at the university level? Do you have particular recommendations to the Bentham Center or to Princeton, what we could do in our teaching curriculum? Um, well, I should have gone through your whole curriculum before this, so <laughs> I, I could have could given a specific comment. So, so I guess there, there are really a couple of thoughts. So, so one is around the role of history and acknowledging that the institutions that we have are a byproduct of that history and may have um, element and character that is defined by that history. Uh, so, so I think that's one thing. And, uh, you know, I've been talking with my team a lot about this conference. I'm super excited about doing this. And one of the, the, the points that I keep saying is that we need to ask ourselves, are institutions benign? Or to what extent is that true? Or do they have other things embedded in them that are going to drive outcomes? Now, I don't know for every market whether that's true or whether that history has been kind of um, smoothed out so that we don't have those biases. But I'm pretty confident that we as a field have not really looked at that deeply. Um, in terms of students, I, I also think that um, thinking about uh, the conditions, and actually let me step back because we have our underwriting rules, right? We know what, how to characterize risk today. Um, but for each of those factors, it could be the case that there's a more complex story that, about how we've gotten to that point. Um, say, 
to the wealth point that um, that that Peter Henry was talking about earlier today. Um, that may mean that wealth is providing you a different signal. It may not be a signal of diligence, or it may it may mean that we have to restructure our our mechanisms or our tools to maybe compensate for those because ultimately what we would like is for you know every individual's talent, their innovation, their imagination uh, to be the merit that is assessed. And if there are these historical realities that might hit them in ways such that that doesn't happen, then we're gonna be worse off for that. So I think there's value in, in that kind of creativity as well. I think you're gonna hear a little bit about this later on, but um, also um, I think there's value in, in trying to um, peel away how we characterize uh, sectors. So the, 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 the small business sector for African-Americans is not monolithic. And I think there are ways for us to, there are places for improvement where we might be able to do better there as well. Uh, so I think all of that is true. Um, I actually think like, a, like a, a, a history of finance course would be super interesting, right? And how we think about uh, the, the tools and the, and, and the instruments as they've evolved. Um, and as, having a segment that, about their intersection and how they transmit uh, into communities and maybe transmit differently I think that'd be very interesting. But do you see, for example, that there should be special financial instruments? Are the average financial instruments not tailored enough for the African-American community, let's say? Should there be particular instruments, mortgages designed in a particular way, which have you know, some insurance component, for example, against some cash flow shocks, uh, which is way more important for poor people rather than for the wealthy people who buy expensive houses? Do you see the real estate or in general one should think more about more general designs of mortgages, just to pick one example? Well, I think you're right on point there that, you know, um, there, there's, what you're saying, I, which I, I totally agree with is perhaps we shouldn't have a one size fits all or a three sizes fits all when we know that there are large segments of the population that have basically the same problem. And so maybe we can design a tool or set of tools to address that problem. And it may unlock possibilities that, that um, would not have been there before. I actually think that's, uh, that's exactly right. And, um, and that encouragement, you know, I, I'm, you know, one of the reasons why I was so excited to do this is because I think this is a venue to start to encourage people to think more expansively about the ways they can make a difference uh, and, and um, more creatively about how we can really have the tools to finance um, touch everyone. Um, let me go back to, you asked about FinTech and technology uh, development. Mm -hmm. I'm actually very excited about that. Like the machine learning makes me nervous because you know, I don't know what they're learning. But in, otherwise, uh, because of how technology has been diffused into society, um, if you can uh, have something that works through a mobile device, you can reach into communities and touch people who wouldn't walk into a bank or wouldn't know how to contact a venture capital investor uh, and create opportunity that way. Uh, we're, we in Atlanta, um, we have, a, uh, you know, Atlanta is in some sense FinTech Central. We, we have a payment uh, 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 specialty here. 70% uh, of all transactions touch a company based in Atlanta. Uh, so our bank has built up a capability on this and uh, we are actually just crafting a paper, um, not on this writ large, but on the idea that technology can be used to promote financial inclusion and that and innovators should be thinking about this. I think that's uh, a really powerful potential um, that's out there. I mean, you look at a company like Cabbage, which was just sold, you know, they're finding ways to do underwriting to small businesses that, you know, we once believed you had to have a in person touch with. Um, so it's possible and, and I think we're gonna continue to see evolution there.